Prostate cancer is unpredictable. Sometimes it progresses and sometimes it's quite indolent. So in the initial phase, when you identify it, you have to decide, will the cure be worse than the disease? Can we just sit back and leave it alone and nothing will happen? So that's watchful waiting. You do routine monitoring and imaging to see is there any evidence of progression, you follow the PSA. And if the cancer seems active, you then intervene. And if it's indolent, you leave it alone. So you don't make the cure worse than disease. But Dr. Ornish and colleagues said, well, we can do better than just watching and waiting passively to see what happens. Let's offer these men the benefit of lifestyle as medicine. Let's give them optimal plant-based nutrition. Let's give them routine physical activity. Let's obviously not give them tobacco or any other toxins. Let's have them get enough sleep. Let's have them manage their stress effectively. And let's make sure they have good, healthy social interactions. Feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love the six-cylinder engine of lifestyle medicine, so says a past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So they fired on all six cylinders and over a span of months studied not so much the men and not so much the cancer in the men, but preferentially the genes in the men with the cancer. And what they found is that the lifestyle intervention took 500 cancer promoter genes and turned them off and 50 cancer suppressor genes shown here and turned them on. Left is before, right is after, red is off, green is on. So activation of genes with a lifestyle intervention. I'm sure you all are aware of the nature nurture debate, right? Which is more important, what we are endowed with genetically or the factors that influence us throughout our lifetime. Well, it's a false debate. It's a false dichotomy. Studies like this one indicate we can nurture nature. DNA with very rare exception is not destiny because although we can't change the genes we have, at least not yet, and I rather hope we, we never will be able to, we certainly can change what the genes we have do. And lifestyle and diet exert powerful influences there. And This is obviously not just one study, it's a whole branch of the literature. And it's important to note that while genes really matter, 95% of our chromosomal real estate is not genes. It's the epigenome, the levers and switches that dictate what the genes do. That's the control center. 95% of chromosomal real estate is the settings that govern the behavior of our genes. And those levers and switches can be reset at any time. It's really there that we exert the influence of lifestyle. And, and epigenetics is a big story in its own right. And we're not going to dive too deep. Again, an opportunity to revisit something in the Q&A if you're so inclined. But we have evidence of the power of lifestyle interacting with the epigenome to change outcomes. This was a study from some years back in the New England Journal of Medicine looking preferentially at adults with high genetic risk for coronary disease. And you see the title in bold here. Adherence to a prescribed healthy lifestyle, the usual elements of that, and then events, whether they had myocardial infarction or whether they died or acute angina. And the answer was a 50% reduction in the rate of all that bad stuff. So acute coronary events of any kind relative to a control group in the group that got the lifestyle intervention, despite having particularly high risk genes. So another indication, DNA is not destiny, but dinner is. We can modify the behavior of our genes. We can modify our genetic risk with lifestyle intervention and taking this all one step further still we can actually change the architecture of our chromosomes. So those green tips shown here at the end of a chromosomal pair are telomeres. They behave very much like the plastic caps at the end of a shoelace, keeping everything from unraveling. And if you've ever lost that plastic cap from the end of your shoelace, you know that your shoelace is apt to follow very much the same with chromosomes. So if you have compromised telomeres, damage to the rest of your chromosome is apt to ensue. And obviously that's a very bad thing. So the telomeres protect that. And the length of the telomere is indicative of its robustness. Longer telomeres, better protection of your chromosomes. And other things being equal, longer telomeres, longer healthy life. Other things being equal, long telomeres don't protect you if you stand in front of moving motor vehicles, for instance. But other things being equal, long telomeres, long healthy life. And in research, again, involving our friend Dr. Ornish and Elizabeth Blackburn, who's a Nobel laureate in medicine for her work in this area, it was shown that lifestyle interventions can actually help grow telomeres. You can lengthen your telomeres and consequently the probability of healthy lifespan with the usual elements of a healthy lifestyle. Optimal nutrition, the centerpiece, physical activity, avoidance of toxins, adequate sleep, management of stress, 
strong social interactions, feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love again and again and again. If we start to focus now preferentially on diet, there's another lens we ought to look through. So it's not just about our DNA and it's not just about the epigenome and it's not just about cell biology because the cells in our bodies are outnumbered roughly 10 to one by the bacteria in our bodies. It doesn't just take a village to raise a human being. It takes a village to be a human being and the village within is the microbiome and you've all heard of it. And of course you hear more and more about the importance of it. And one of the questions that arose in my world because of the burgeoning recognition of how important the microbiome is and how it influences every organ system was, well, do I need to eat to feed my microbiome now? In other words, should I throw out everything I thought I knew about healthy nutrition because we're learning new things about what our intestinal bacteria need and what they like? And just to cut to the chase here, it would be weird. It would be illogical. If in order to be a healthy human, of which the microbiome is a part, we had to eat one way, but in order to have a healthy microbiome, we needed to eat a different way. It would be every bit as weird if we told you to eat for your own health, do this, but to eat for the health of your right kidney, do that. And by the way, to eat for the health of your left kidney, do this other thing. How could you possibly be healthy? Or you can have healthy kidneys, but you eat to, need to eat a different way for your liver or your heart or your spleen. These are all just parts of us. And the best way to have healthy parts is to be a healthy whole. The microbiome is an integral and critically important part of us. But I would recommend you think of it as just another vital organ. It's part of what it takes to be a healthy human. So everything we thought we knew about what makes us healthy obviously needed to be making the microbiome healthy just the way it needed to be making the liver and the kidneys and the heart and the spleen and the brain healthy because otherwise we wouldn't be healthy. And that's, in fact, what this study shows. So a large study looking across many other studies, whoops, went backwards instead of forward somehow, uh, reaching the conclusion, large population-based survey confirms and extends findings of other small studies. Plant and fiber-rich dietary choices associated with more diverse, in other words, more robust, healthier microbiota and greater potential to produce short-chain fatty acids, which is a good thing. So if we translate this into the vernacular, what's good for us to eat is good for our microbiome and vice versa. No big surprise there, but important, I think, to make that case. Sadly, although we've known all this for 30 years, and personally, I devoted my career to translating what we knew 30 years ago, if not more, into what we do, knowledge has not proven to be power. Knowledge is only power if you translate it into routine action and put it to good use. So something indelible, something luminous, something so incredibly promising as the elimination of 80% of chronic disease and premature death in the world around us has been lost, not in translation, but in want of translation, the failure to translate what we know into what we routinely do. And the cost of that has been enormously high over these past 30 years. When we take stock specifically of where are we now with food, the simple conclusion is it's killing too many of us. Food is killing too many. It's not hunger, not starvation. Our food is killing too many of us. This was an op-ed in the New York Times. Note the date here, August of 2019. Interesting timing because this was months before we were overwhelmed by SARS-CoV-2, and I'll return to the pandemic along the way here. Uh, but essentially, we already had a pandemic. That's what this op-ed was about. So this focused in particular on the U.S. And it was written by the former dean of nutrition at Tufts, and former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. So they focused on the US, but the message really was about the world. And they cited the primary literature, which I'll show you in just a second, indicating that more than 500 of, 500,000 of us in the US alone die prematurely from poor diet quality. Again, not hunger, not lack of food, not even food insecurity, just too much junk where food ought to be, 500,000 premature deaths. And I'll remind all of you that during the pandemic in the United States, when we crossed that threshold, when we had suffered 500,000 casualties to SARS-CoV-2, we had a national moment of silence and reflection and grieving. We crossed that threshold with food, something we completely control every year. 
and there is no mourning or grieving or recognition or silence. It hides in plain sight and it siphons years from life as well as life from years, year in and year out. This is the pandemic we ignore. This is the pandemic where familiarity breeds, if not contempt, complacency. Our food is killing too many of us. This despite how much we've known about this for the past 30 years and more. This is part of the body of evidence underlying that. This is the global burden of disease study I mentioned. So we can really think of this as sharing DNA with McGinnis and Fagy's seminal study I showed you at the start, a massive epidemiologic effort to gather data from multiple sources and make sense out of the patterns in the world. This was an examination of 195 countries and it reached this indelible conclusion. Diet quality measured objectively is the single leading predictor variable for premature death and chronic disease in the modern world, full stop. So back in 1990, it was tobacco and diet was a distant second. That gap narrowed. Diet has now overtaken tobacco, both because we're smoking less, but because we're still eating just as badly, if not worse, with more ultra processed foods, for instance. Diet quality is the leading predictor variable for premature death and chronic disease. So again, this talk is all about making the evidence-based case for diet as a vital sign. That ought to clinch it right there. You measure these things because they matter. What could matter more than the single leading predictor of premature death and chronic disease? And all of this was acutely relevant during our experience in the pandemic. So colleagues and I contributed this paper relatively early on. We did the work early in 2020. It got published in September. Looking at the distribution of chronic diseases in the general population that put people at elevated risk for bad outcomes from COVID. We already knew at that time that elderly people and people with chronic disease did much worse when they got SARS-CoV-2. So how prevalent? We found that six out of 10 American adults had at least one of these chronic conditions, lifestyle and diet related. Four out of 10 of us had two or more, putting them at extremely high risk. So young people with chronic disease were at the same risk of death and serious infection as people decades older. And this was hyper endemic. So again, it wasn't really just one pandemic. It was a pandemic interacting with a prior pandemic. And these were colliding in communities throughout the United States. And this got picked up by the New York Times. So Nadia Popovich and her colleagues at the Times based this article, which came out in May of 2020, on our paper, among others, and talked about how prevalent these conditions were. So chronic health conditions and the coronavirus could collide. This was anticipatory. Now, you would think here we are being forewarned. We might be forearmed. We might prevent this from turning into a disaster. You try to prevent collisions in your life, right? but we didn't. So here again is the New York Times, just about two years later, it's a little hard to see down at the bottom, but this is April of 2022. So May of 2020, April of 2022, almost exactly two years later, COVID and diabetes, here's the word again, colliding in a public health train wreck. We saw the light at the end of the tunnel. We knew it was an oncoming train. We didn't get out of the way because we didn't do anything during COVID about hypertension or diabetes or obesity. We had no, let's get healthy together. Let's elevate diet quality. Let's not just immunize against SARS-CoV-2. Let's immunize by elevating health. Let's use vitality as the consummate vaccine that protects against everything. Did anybody hear any of that? Because I sure didn't. And it was an unbelievable missed opportunity because everybody was acutely worried. It was a teachable moment. There was an incredible chance to elevate the nation's health and defend against bad outcomes, not only from SARS-CoV-2, but everything else. And we did none of that. And frankly, I think that was a tragic missed opportunity. We have evidence that diet quality per se directly correlated with outcomes with SARS-CoV-2. So low diet quality and infection by SARS-CoV-2 bad outcome. Other things being equal, high diet quality, infection, better outcome. And there seemed to be a direct inverse correlation with objective measures of diet quality. So once again, the argument that diet quality should be a vital sign, it was acutely relevant during the pandemic, just as it is chronically relevant to all the outcomes that matter most, years in life and life in years. I have to say, I felt pretty lonely 
during much of the pandemic as I was ranting about this and saying, you know, there's no discussion of general health promotion. There's no talk about helping people elevate their diet quality, increase their physical activity, get healthy. Let's get healthy together. Let's not just focus myopically on the virus. Yes, it's, it's obviously important, but there's so much we could do to alleviate the burden of prior chronic disease that's putting us all at elevated risk for bad outcomes here. Why are we ignoring the big picture? 